uh, members, we have an opportunity to hear from Mr. Hockenyos now, if that's what you want to do. And Mr. Hockenyos, what I would ask you to do is if you could, I mean, uh, if it takes more time, fine. And if you get questions, fine. But we, we, I, my goal would be for us to go into executive session at 2 o'clock or shortly after 2. That's exactly what I was saying, yeah. I know you well, and uh, you're a friend. So thank you all. If you could take your conversations outside, uh, that will be helpful, helpful to us because we still have work that we, we need to do. But thank you all for being here. That completely fell on deaf ears. There's no one listening. I'm listening. Bless you. You are. Yeah. What did you say, Mayor? What did you say? Could all the conversations be taken outside, please? But thank you for being here. All right, Brother Hockenyos. Calculated. I looked. I thought I had 40 minutes. I don't have time to do this in 12. So let me hit a couple of the high points for you all. Uh, I can I can be quick and I can talk fast, but I can't do it quite that fast. That's all right. Go ahead. So long do story what you short, need to do. we we have had a period in the United States of extraordinary stimulus. We had all the faucets wide open. We had exceptionally accommodative monetary policy. That means interest rates were super low. We jammed something on the order of $7 trillion in stimulus into a $21 trillion economy. That did a lot of interesting things at the local level here in Austin, not the least of which was after we all got sick to death of uh, our front porches being jammed up with Amazon packages, uh, we found other ways to spend money, and sales tax boomed as a result. So we've had an exceptionally rapid run here for quite a period of time. It's coming to an end. The Fed has raised interest rates. I don't know how many times. It's 425 basis points. They're going to do it again next week. In my humble opinion, that's a mistake, and I'll tell you why. But they've clearly taken the punch bowl away from the party. Uh, and so nationally, it's almost a certainty we are headed into a recession. Austin never is as negatively impacted by national trends as the rest of the country is for a variety of reasons. We are, in fact, seeing some some negative things here around what I would call our soft technology group, and that's Indeed, that's Meta, that's Alphabet, because they're fundamentally driven by advertising, and advertising is drying up. But if you saw the recent report from Tesla, Tesla committed to create 5,000 jobs and invest $2 billion in the summer of 2020. As of their most recent report to Travis County, they've invested $5.8 billion, created 12,227 jobs. They told me off the record it's going to be quite a bit bigger number than that. They're going to invest quite a bit more money. We've seen what's happening in Samsung. We are actually becoming a center of manufacturing uh, industry, and it's particularly hard tech stuff, which is really, really good for us. So take it all together. We're going to be in a little bit better shape than the rest of the country, but things are definitely going to slow down. One of the things to pay attention to is it, I think it's actually two things to pay attention to. One is the continued challenges on the labor force side. I have a chart in here that talks about the sort of the permanent reduction in labor force participation. That's a real issue here. Your favorite restaurant isn't open on Mondays and Tuesdays, not for lack of demand. It's because they can't find staff at the end of the day, and that tracks back to the cost of living here and things that we've been talking about really as a municipality as long as I can remember, guys. Uh, but the other thing to pay attention to here, and then I'll shut up and take some questions, project finance is about to dry up. The banking crisis is real. It's particularly real right now if you're trying to get financing for a major project. The office market, to use the technical term, is dead uh, and is going to be dead going forward. And so banks have increased their underwriting standards the capital is more available, and the equity requirements are greater than they have been really since the Great Recession uh, in 2008, 2009. And what that means is we have a lot of stuff under construction right now. Obviously, that's going to finish up. A lot of stuff in the pipeline is going to go away until the next cycle comes on through. So that's a real quick and dirty. I had about 45 slides, and they sort of rolled up to all that. Well, can you um, so anyway? make sure everybody has them? Yes, we do. Um, make sure everybody has them, and if we have, if, if there are questions, certainly, um, I know you'll accommodate that. Of course. 
Um, Mayor, if I could just ask sure. John, you did have about 45 slides. You do have this in your backup. Right. There will also be a written report coming out this afternoon that will have a lot of what John said and didn't say in the narrative. There was one slide in particular I wanted uh, John to speak to a little bit. It's this one where he talks about a recession being almost a certainty. Maybe you could just elaborate on This was to me was the takeaway slide from it. So the, there are a lot of different indicators that, that suggest kind of that kind of take the temperature of the economy, if you will. And I stole this because like everybody else, you know, why reinvent the wheel if somebody else will do a better job than I will. But what this basically tells you is that all the different things that you would look at that would point toward the direction of the economy and specifically a recession are pretty well flashing bright red lights. And that's important. There's also a backup slide. This shows it in sort of the, the change over the last Eight to, I guess it's 12 to 18 months, but it also shows where all these indicators were in times of previous recession. And this is entirely consistent with where we have been in the past when we moved into recession as a national economy. Yeah, that is a takeaway slide. Questions, comments? Yes, Councilmember Allison Alter. So we're reading this slide. Is it that it's deteriorating? I mean, how do we read this slide? Left, it's right to left. <laughs> okay. So pretend it's in Cyrillic. And that, that is what was last summer? That what? was last summer. Okay. Yeah, it's a little confusing. It took me a minute to, to work that out, too. Okay, so it's basically saying it's all going down. Yeah, it's, it's moving from right to left. Thank you. Councilmember Vela? You, with our uh, affordability concerns and our super tight labor market, I think well, we're at two percent, three percent unemployment, uh, which I remember towards people in the '80s. I would say that was not possible to get uh, unemployment uh, that low. Uh, is it? Is it? I mean, long term, could it be a positive, healthy thing for uh, affordability, real estate to slow down, for the job market to go back to a you know a, a, a normal? In other words, let everybody kind of catch their breath and retrench a little bit i mean well how uh, i understand things gonna have to slow down how do we best manage the slowdown how do we use that you know to our advantage locally so those of you who have had to listen to me in the past probably have heard my schoolhouse rock three is a magic number speech which is if you can get three percent job growth and three percent inflation and three percent interest rates and it's consistent you can plan for it and everything's great uh, so your point is well taken. You're right. It will, it will take a little bit of the pressure off. But in the last five years, we've created almost 230,000 jobs in Travis County, and we've permitted 72,000 housing units. So there's a supply mismatch there. And I, as an economist, will tell you that lots more housing supply would be a huge help, both really in terms of affordability, which would in turn have a positive impact on the labor force as well. And from from my perspective, and, and I understand that lending for um, the commercial uh, is drying up. Uh, my sense right now, again, just from folks that I talk to, is that housing construction, though the, the demand is still high enough Extremely. that there are projects that are continuing to move forward, and I think that's critical in the sense we've got to build through the slowdown from a housing perspective if we're going to catch up to an extremely extremely tight market. Any suggestions as to how we, we do that? I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, the, the, it's, there will be some challenges financing that, but you are absolutely right. The best time to build is when, you know, prices are down, when labor is a little more available because the market's not so hot and the cost of materials hopefully abates a little bit. Uh, and so, in fact, the, the focus as a city and as a region goes back to supply. And we, there's no indication that over the medium and longer term we're going to be anything other than what we've been since the mayor and I have been running around here, which is a really, really desirable place for people to live, work, and raise their families. Thank you. One other thing I might mention is that with a roughly, well, in excess of $20 billion in infrastructure projects coming online, um, we have... A gap, we have a gap in terms of workforce for, for infrastructure projects. Yes. Uh, work, uh, the workforce Solutions of uh, Central Texas uh, has uh, 
we, we, we has got a great program to help right now to do a study on what is the gap, but also what do we need to do with regard to training so that we can that's, – that's basically going to be a sector of our economy with that kind of money yeah. and with that – with that kind of need, which also adds to the affordability for some because that's a lower barrier job and it tends to pay higher than what some jobs uh, uh, do. So, anyway, there's, th that's another thing for us to look at. Councilmember Ryan Alter. I was wondering if you could talk about, if this is within your realm of expertise, the impact to either a local economy or for an individual, if you compare giving them, let's say, or saving them $100 on their tax bill versus giving them $100 to spend on child care, what's the, the difference? They, same $100, but... Yeah, it, it, it depends slightly on who we're talking about, but I think your broader point is child care is one of the great barriers to employment in the United States right now, for, particularly for people who are working at lower skilled jobs, there's not enough slots in child care to accommodate the demand and the slots that are available are too expensive. So you get a multiplier effect in, in some sense on helping people meet those basic needs. You actually increase the labor force participation which has all kinds of positive effects. And so I think, I think that's what you're teeing up and I completely agree. The more we can bring people back into the labor force and the more we can get them making a wage that allows them to sort of live comfortably in this community, the better off all of us are going to be. Thank you, and uh, sorry for the abbreviated report, yeah. but... Um, I should practice like this. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. We appreciate you. Thank you, Mary. I have a quick question. Yes. Is, are you going to be able to be around as we go further down the discussions of budgets so we can review this and have a chance to ask I uh, You have questions? only to ask. I, I live about a mile from here, so, yeah, no problem. Okay. I'd be happy to be back. Great. Thank great. you, Mary.